cornfields, oil sands, and the real cost of quenching America's insatiable thirst for energy security. You are here on the map. Tonight, environmental salvation in the gas tank and the fastest way to kick the addiction to oil. Welcome to the age of ethanol hype. I'll take on former CIA director and ethanol enthusiast, Jim Woolsey. And if Alberta's tar sands are America's gas tank, where are we going? And who's really driving? Hello, I'm Avi Lewis. Welcome to On the Map. The price of beer is on the rise in Germany. The cost of tortillas has jumped in Mexico. Just a couple of side effects of the latest American energy boom, ethanol. According to a U.S. government report released yesterday, this year almost 30% of the country's entire corn crop will be used to make fuel, not food. And that is just the tip of the melting iceberg. The White House wants to quadruple ethanol production in the next quarter century. It is clearly time to talk about the global implications of the Great Green Hope. America is officially ethanol crazy. So far, it's all being made from corn. As prices have soared, American farmers have planted the biggest corn crop in U.S. history. A green fuel success story, right? Not exactly. Corn needs three times more fertilizer than any other crop. And fertilizers are themselves a major source of greenhouse gases. Ethanol boosters say the solution is to make it from cellulose, prairie grass, farm waste. But the technology for that is years away. Nevertheless, boosters aren't hard to find these days. It's become big, big business. In Canada's last federal budget, two and a half billion dollars in biofuel subsidies. In the States, from five to eight billion dollars a year. And who's getting that money? Mostly agribusiness giants like Archer Daniels Midland, whose corn division almost tripled its profit last year. And there's no end in sight to the corporate welfare line, because despite all of its problems, ethanol has positioned itself as a key component of U.S. energy security. Well, our next guest is best known for his work in national security as director of the CIA in the mid-90s. But he has recently turned his attention and passion to energy security and ethanol. Jim Woolsey is co-chair of the Committee on the Present Danger, an oil and security advisory board. He joins me now from Montreal. Jim Woolsey, welcome to On the Map. Thank you. Good to be with you. Now, in a recent speech, you said, uh, quote, American farmers, by making the commitment to grow more corn for ethanol, are at the tip of the spear on the war against terrorism. Would you like to flesh out that argument for me? Yes. Uh, Corn-based uh, ethanol is only a start, but it's an important start to moving away from uh, petroleum-based fuels for transportation. I think the biggest step is going to be uh, coming here within the next two or three years. Uh, General Motors says with, in under three years they're going to be in production with a plug-in hybrid uh, vehicle, and uh, Toyota uh, is uh, very much in the race as well. Let's, let's go back uh, to the security argument and your, and, and your suggestion that it's uh, imperative for the United States to get off its uh, addiction to Middle Eastern oil. I remember that you signed a letter for the uh, project for the New American Century urging the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. You've been an enthusiastic proponent yes. of the war in Iraq. Hasn't that one conflict alone done more to undercut American security and stoke hatred of, of the United States than any green fuel could ever undo? No, I don't think so. I think that uh, one of the, if, if we had cared about only the price of oil in Iraq, if we hadn't been concerned about Saddam's human rights record, about his ties with terrorist groups, uh, about the weapons that which were, were being we're, which for we're still waiting, so forth, we're still waiting for any uh, evidence of, of, of those charges, but go ahead. Uh, well, you're, you're really not, not if you're fair. But the point is that if we move away from dependence on petroleum, we don't have to go through the types of concerns that drove some people, it wasn't my main interest, but drove some people to believe that, uh, that Iraq was more important than other parts of the world in terms of human rights. At the moment, though, we're looking at the biggest corn harvest uh, in history in the United States this year uh, because the corn uh, industry has exploded um, because mm -hmm. of ethanol. Now, the thing about ethanol is we need to talk about how green it actually is. Corn uses three times more fertilizer than any other U.S. crop, according to the USDA. Mm -hmm. and, and the fertilizers emit nitrous oxide, which is like 310 times the emissions of, of carbon dioxide. And the ethanol refineries that are popping up all over the United States, many of them are powered by coal. So tell me again exactly how this ethanol boom is going to help save the planet. 
Well, with corn-based ethanol, you only get a reduction net after you look at everything of about maybe 20 or 30 percent in global warming gas emissions compared to gasoline. But once you're using a, a stover, the residue from corn or, uh, or prairie grass, you get an 80, 90 percent reduction in global warming gas emissions. Now, in theory, you're a, you're a free market guy. But ethanol was built with billions of dollars of taxpayers' money. Ethanol uh, corn subsidies are some, somewhere in the range of 5 to $8 billion a year now. You've got massive tariffs that put the lie to the whole free trade rhetoric that keep foreign ethanol out of the American market. You've got a tax exemption on ethanol. Why does this industry need so much corporate welfare? Well, I'm no uh, tariff supporter, but uh, Boyd and Gray, the ambassador to the EU from the United States, uh, wrote a year ago just before he went to Brussels, uh, that uh, uh, the subsidies to the oil business in the United States total about $250 billion a year. What you can't do is continue, I think reasonably, is continue all the subsidies to oil and then not have uh, any way for uh, any of these alternative liquid green fuels uh, to uh, compete. Isn't that precisely the problem, though, that, uh, th that green fuels uh, are being used as a cover for another massive transfer of, of public wealth to, to big corporations, they're just doing, you know, you, you've just got a, a, a perfect transformation of, this, oh, of the is, corporate this welfare is, system. This is gaga land. As long as you are Welcome moving Welcome to on away, the map, Jim. <laughs> right. As long as you're moving toward general feedstocks of all sorts, waste feedstocks, uh, agricultural waste, uh, uh, municipal waste, uh, uh, the prairie grasses and the rest, Nobody can control that as a single company. It's just silly for anyone to suggest they can. These are all over the place, all over the world. You know, this could be the one and only time I get to interview a former director of the CIA. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask one question about the agency. And this goes to a lot of what we've been talking about. Since the 1950s, when the CIA first experimented with regime change in Guatemala on behalf of the United Fruit Company, and then in Iran to install the Shah and, and maintain American access to oil, uh, to the fabrication of, of intelligence to justify the invasion of Iraq, hasn't the role of the CIA always been as much advancing U.S. business interests as its nominal goal of defending America? No, I don't think so. I think that's really a silly, contentious uh, uh, query. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the CIA operates at the behest of the President and the Congress, and uh, since the mid-1970s, anything it does uh, overseas uh, other than collect intelligence has to be done pursuant to a finding by the president submitted to the intelligence uh, committees of the Congress. It's a instrumentality the, the, of the U.S. government. If you feel that way about the U.S. government, then you feel that way about the CIA. It's up to you. <laughs> you said it, not I. Thanks for being on the map, Jim. Right. When we come back, ethanol is not the only answer to America's craving for energy close to home. How Alberta's oil sands will keep the U.S. hooked on fossil fuels and change Canada's role on the global stage.